All right, so let's uh, start the session. Uh, so uh, welcome everyone to this panel session about uh, academic economists in the media. So my name is Robert Deur and I'm a professor of economics at Erasmus University Rotterdam and I will chair this session today. And this session is co-organized by the European Economic Association together with the Royal Dutch Economic Association. And um, so this session is about uh, communication by academic economists. Now, academic economists, they communicate a lot, but typically uh, they do so with each other, like at this Congress uh, or with students during office hours or in the classroom. However, from time to time, we have an opportunity to speak to a much bigger audience, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, sometimes even millions of people. And that happens when we talk with uh, the media. And the aim of this session today is to share some key lessons about how to do that. So questions that will be addressed include, when should we agree to comment on an issue in the media? Uh, what types of research findings merit wide dissemination? How should we handle various kinds of media? And how should we deal with responses in particular on social media? So we have two excellent speakers today to discuss this matters with us. Daniel Hemmermesh from Barnard College and ITSA and Dina Pomerans from the University of Zurich. So Dina Pomerans, she is an expert in the area of development economics and public finance. She is one of the most influential economists on Twitter, where she shares the latest in economics research with her more than 60,000 followers, and often she also engages in discussions. She is seen as a role model in communicating about econ economics by many, and she will talk about the role of econ Twitter, and she will share some tips for those of us who are new to it, and probably also for some who are already acquainted to it, some hidden secrets. And our second, uh, well, we will start the session with uh, Daniel Hammermesh. So Dan, he's an expert in the area of labor economics. His academic work is not only highly influential within academia, but has also attracted considerable attention from the media. And now Dan has throughout his career written a number of papers offering advice to scholars in economics, in particular to young scholars. And one of those pieces is a media guide for economists. And today he will also build on that piece uh, to uh, provide us advice on how to deal with media. But before I give the screen then to Dan, let me mention that this session is being recorded and it will uh, appear on YouTube uh, later today, perhaps tomorrow. Um, if you would like to raise a question, then you are most welcome to add it to the Q&A, which you can find in the center on the bottom of your screen. And here you can also read the questions that have been raised by others. And you can even vote on them so as to indicate you find them important. And my colleague, Bart de Koning and I, we will make a selection of questions and, and ask them in the final part of this session to, to Dina and Dan. And of course, it would be helpful if you indicate to whom you would like to address uh, your question uh, if you don't want to uh, address them to both of the speakers. So without further ado, uh, please then, uh, the screen is yours. It's a great pleasure to have you uh, and we look forward to your talk. Thank you very much, Robert. Thanks for having me. Thanks for organizing this. I think this is really important. So I'm really looking forward to this. Let me start off by noting that I am an old man and I'm using old media. I don't do Twitter because what well, a man I call the orange buffoon, the president of the United States does so much Twitter and I don't wanna be doing what he does, okay? So that's my reason for that. Let me share my screen here and let you see my notes, which are somewhere along here. There we go. Can you see the notes? Are no. the notes fit? No? Oh, darn it. That's coming. That's better. Okay, fine. Good. Okay. So what I want to talk about is why one should spend one's time doing it. Okay. Uh, 
there we go. First of all, I think despite the fact that academics value publications in journals, be it good journals or be mediocre journals, the administrators of your organization do like it. They like the fact that you're doing it. I'm not sure there are any rewards for it, but in fact, the people who are your bosses, as it were, do think about this. The other thing is, look, we get into this economics business because we enjoy doing research because we were good at mathematics in secondary school and university, but we also got into it, most of us, because we care about policy and public events. So I think about my own career in terms of the number of hours, person hours I have influenced in my life. I've taught 25,000 students for 40 hours a term. That's about a million person hours. If I appear on a television show for five minutes before 5 million people, which I have a couple of times, okay, that's already 400,000. You do two of these, you've had more influence on real people than you would in an entire very, very teaching intensive career. So if you're interested in influencing people, this is the way you are going to be useful and influence them. Another reason for doing it is basically, I find it to be great fun. Indeed, when I'm teaching um, rational addiction in one of my classes, I tell the students that I am addicted to publicity in the sense that's a classic example. If I do a lot of media things within the week, I start getting less excited about it. But if God forbid I get no media attention for a month, I start having withdrawal symptoms. And for that reason, it's, I find it to be fun. Another thing is that you get better at it over time and you feel some confidence in your ability to influence the average person. Another reason for doing it is that it can cause controversy. And if you read uh, Plato's Apology, Socrates said, I am that gadfly on the body politic. Part of our job is to be a gadfly on the body politic to do something different and to influence people and get them for a change to think. Okay? It generates constructive debate. That's one thing we do. We get people to think and talk to each other. Another issue though, which I think is really important, and you've got to be ready for this if you're going to be in the media and get any attention. A, sometimes your colleagues who resent the attention that you're getting are jealous and they will make nasty remarks about you and undercut you. My response to that, too damn bad. I'm doing something that benefits society. If you don't like it, do it yourself and do a better job. Another thing that you'll get, which I've gotten Lord knows quite enough of, is I would call hate mail. Although nowadays it comes as hate email. I think a paper I have, which is coming out in January, finally, in working paper form, I got hate mail from a rather distinguished economist who had a one word email to me, shame. And I should have responded by saying, some idiot is sending emails over your name, change your password, darn it. But I didn't respond that way. I would, in retrospect, I wish I had. How do you do this? First of all, your university, your research institution wants you to do this. They have staff whose sole goal is to get you in the media. And they're looking for things to do because most academics are either too shy or mistakenly think this is not important and don't give the staff very much business. Another way to do this, and IZA, it says Robert calls it, the European name, our discussion papers ask you to put a non-technical summary of what you've done which is a great way to have something that appeals to journalists that they can then use with minimal effort. So I would definitely do that. Also, once you do this, if you develop a relationship with some journalist, I don't think journalists are lazy, but if they can get the same information from you easily, as opposed to chasing around for somebody else, they will approach you again and again and again. And so it's kind of thing, it's a snowball. Once you start it down the hill, it picks up more snow and you get more attention. It can even, as it did in one case for me now, I think 23 years ago, a discussion with a journalist can lead to a new scholarly paper. 
So I did a paper on the effects of limiting daily overtime hours in California with a colleague, Steve Treo, and that was actually suggested directly by a journalist who's probably one of the smartest people I've ever met. This is unusual to be sure, but it does happen. How to do it. First of all, what's interesting in what you do? I don't think people want to see about the latest game theoretic proof of equilibrium that you might have done. As important as that might be, the journalist, the public, just doesn't give a hoot about that. What's interesting in what you do? Sadly enough, anything to do with demography, sex, marriage, birth, and death, the public eats this stuff up, the journalists eat it up. That's the kind of stuff one should be talking about. Things currently. I mean, I'm shocked. I keep track of the number of eats of discussion papers. As you might have noticed, since March, my guess is there have been 100 eats of discussion papers having to do with COVID, okay? These days, anything on COVID would get media attention. It can, even something absolutely ridiculous, like the one paper I did on COVID, made it to some media attention. So people just lap the stuff up. There are no question about it, fads. Unusual things, you think of Steve Levitt's stuff about the sumo wrestlers, for example, that got a lot of attention, not because anybody in the West gives a hoot about sumo wrestling, but rather because it was sort of a very cute, neat idea. I thought about doing some empirical work on this, and so I went and got the list of my most heavily cited, Web of Science cited, uh, papers that I've published over what is a ridiculously long career, okay? Now, it's not because the journalists are reading the AER, the JPE, or the QJE, I can assure you of that. Rather, it's because these things are working papers put out often by the NBER or ITSA that those operations publicize. So here are my 10 most heavily cited papers. So I went through them and listed how much publicity each of them got. And the original beauty paper, 94 was everywhere. It made the front pages of newspapers really all over the world. It was quite remarkable. Paper on lawyers down below certainly did. These other ones here, my suicide paper, which is before anybody else on this session was born probably. These are the dark ages. It actually made the front page of the Wall Street Journal. Uh, the paper on beauty in the classroom, some. Paper on sleep made the front page of the New York Times, which to an American is just number one. As my wife derisively pointed out to me, however, Daniel, it was below the fold. In journalism, if you're below the fold of a paper, that ain't so good as being above the fold. Uh, paper on discrimination in baseball, published two, nine years ago, made an awful lot of publicity. It made the New York Times, but regrettably inside. So I think you can see from this list of publications and which ones made it, which ones didn't, uh, that it is my citation of things on demography, policy interests that get it, even though quite frankly, the best paper I ever did got absolutely no PR because it was of interest only to economists. When should you seek publicity? The answer is absolutely clear at the working paper stage. Is your work done then? I don't know, when I put a working paper out, I think it's done, uh, even though editors and referees think it's not done at all and you spend many, many months fixing the darn thing up, okay? Another reason for that is, unlike the natural sciences where you do something that's gonna be published within six months, in our business, in the so-called top journals, it's four plus years. I say two here, but it's really four plus years. By the time you do something in print, it's really, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's like digging out uh, in a pyramid what's been done. It's so ancient. Question is that journalists will often ask you, is the paper peer reviewed? And the answer you have to give is say, it's in a working paper series that is sufficiently respected that it is implicitly peer reviewed. So I would say yes, even though I know that's not really correct. Otherwise, you'll never be in the media. So to me, if it's an NBR working paper, that is sufficient. It is peer reviewed in my mind. But you will get that question. It's important to be ready for it.
some advice here. First of all, never argue with a journalist, okay? They may make outrageous comments. They may not know what the devil they're talking about. Don't argue because they will just shut you right down, aside from the fact it's not very polite. Answer their questions, whatever the questions are, but of course, be, behave like a politician. You wanna get your ideas across, and therefore you should steer the question to the answer that you think illustrates the point you're making. In other words, you control the dialogue, even though they're asking questions. Get your point across, go into any interview, no matter what the medium you're on, having in mind, that it's like teaching. You want to get a couple of ideas across to the students. In this case, the student is a journalist who's your conduit to the real world. Never use jargon. Elasticity is jargon. Demand curve, I spent half my life working on demand curves. Demand is jargon. Endogeneity, nobody knows what the devil endogeneity means. Causality, no. Never use abbreviation. RCT, nobody knows what an RCT is. It may not be the bad thing in general, but certainly nobody knows what an RCT is. And you've got to be careful not to use this kind of language, which we use so loosely among ourselves. Be succinct. Don't blab on. Not too short but just right. It's sort of like Goldilocks and the Three Bears. Think about that in dealing with the media. Okay, different kinds of media. You go on print or online media, one reason they may have you on is because you're an expert on something. Like over the years, I've gotten questions about the monthly unemployment data that come out in the U.S. I worked in labor department many, many years ago. I know a bit about that. So that's one reason I might be on. You might be asked because you've done stuff that journalists have seen. If you're asked about something, for goodness sake, don't just spend the whole time talking about your own work. There's nothing that any of us have ever worked on where we're the only person who's ever thought about it. You may have done it better than others, but for goodness sake, your desire is to impart knowledge and your knowledge is not the only one ever created on this topic. So be generous to other people while still tooting your own horn. One thing for certain, you are not an expert on everything. My favorite example in the last two years is this nincompoop advisor of Trump's, Peter Navarro, who is an economist of sorts, uh, people may know who he is, who's been sounding off during the last six months about vaccines and how good hydrochloroquine is, giving his expert opinion about that. This is a disgrace. It's a disgrace to the economic profession. It's a disgrace to him as an individual. And if you do this, you will be rightly told you don't know what the devil you're talking about. So please, you're not an expert on everything. On your own work, you wanna make your work understandable. You wanna get your idea across. Don't qualify everything. We always write in our papers, oh, what about this? What about this? What about that? Be modest, but for goodness sake, state the idea. Example, an interview I did on the paper that got the shame comment from this economist in The Economist three years ago. Watch out. You may make a long statement, but everything you must you say must be if taken out of context, coherent and get the idea across. It should be like the moon. If you look at the moon from here, it's a few large craters. As you get closer, you see littler craters and littler craters, and they're all craters. And the same thing should be true for what you say to the media. Each little bit should be comprehensible and get your idea across. I think that's like a fractal, as I understand fractals. In radio, it's very much like in print. You'll be asked to be a general expert on something or to talk about your own research. In doing radio, just as you would when you're teaching, modulate your voice. Don't be monotone. Okay? A good teacher is never monotone. I've seen enough bad teachers observing younger colleagues to know what's good and what's bad. Never talk for more than 30 seconds in a row on radio. Okay? And the lesser, the better. 
that allows for more ideas to go back and forth, and it allows people to not to get bored with what you're saying. Avoid jargon, because if you want to use jargon, which you shouldn't anyway, you haven't got the time to explain it. Examples, I did an econ talk podcast, good grief. I think last, no, it was March of 2019, something called econ talk about a new book I wrote. And people tell me it was a pretty decent job. But to me, podcasts are like radio. Another example, I did something on BBC a couple of years ago that went fairly well. And I don't all go well, believe me, as you'll see in a second. Discussion shows. Sometimes there's a discussion show and I have three minutes left. I'll finish up in time. Don't worry, Robert. Uh, you're a panelist. Get your point across. And the good thing to do is to interact with the other panelists. Play off them. Don't monopolize the microphone. If you're long distance, sometimes um, I've been on the BBC, I've been at Austin, Texas, somebody else in the studio. In those cases, watch out because the person in the studio will possibly try to monopolize the conversation and the moderator of the conversation will often get taken. At one point, this is, gosh, eight years ago, I was on a BBC4 program from Austin. The moderator let the person in the studio talk and talk and talk. There were two minutes left. I hung up the phone. I just decided, why should I listen to this woman grave about something and let the moderator ruin my life? And this was considered a tremendous shock. I was so proud of myself, however. Call-ins. A call-in show is often a disaster. People who spend their time listening to radio call-ins I don't know, the average IQ may be 80, but it's not good. And there are people who have access to grind. Nonetheless, you got to deal with them. So be polite, try to answer the questions, etc. Be patient. You'll have to make your point every time on a show like that, again and again and again. Do it. TV and video, like right now, 15 seconds, that's all you get. As one media person told me, it's a hot medium. 15 second spurts, same things as before, news items or your own work, dress and behavior. Uh, I don't know, I'm in fact not wearing any pants right now. You can be naked below the waist, nobody cares because nobody's gonna see you above, you can't even see my hand, there's my hand, that's all you see, okay? So you, you, you don't have to wear anything below the waist if you don't wish to. Maintain good posture. I was on a local TV show at 7 a.m. once in Austin, I came back and my wife, who's my biggest fan and harshest critic, said, Daniel, you slouch the whole time. Okay, don't slouch. Maintain good posture, but don't be stiff. Conclusion. The main point I want to stress, other than these how-tos, is that this is really important stuff. Okay, you're going to have more influence on the real world or the world generally with the stuff you do. The influence may be inchoate. Okay, as, as Keynes said in his essays and biography, uh, madmen distilling ideas from the ether are reliant upon some defunct academic scribbler. That's almost a perfect quote. And you are too, you're not defunct, but you're an academic scribbler and hopefully people will get your ideas. Don't be shy, but don't be too much of a publicity hound. If you're not the best person on some general topic to talk, Refer it to somebody else you know. There'll be other opportunities. Finally, there are right ways to do this. There are wrong ways. Lord knows I've made enough mistakes in my life, and maybe you can learn from some of them to do a little bit better than I've done over the last many years. Again, thank you, Robert, for having me. Thank you, Dan. This was a very interesting, amusing, and very useful talk. Thanks so much. So now we go to our second speaker, uh, Dina. The screen is yours. Thank you. I'm going to um, share my presentation. Second year. Here we go. Oh, okay, great. So uh, thank you very much for this invitation. Um, and as Robert said in the introduction, so the, 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 the audience I was told to have in mind here are people who are sort of new to Twitter, maybe you have an account, but you're not really sure how to use it, or you have always thought um, 
like damn this is only for people who want to read uh, Donald Tr read Donald Trump and um, maybe surprised to hear what is actually going on there so for those of you who are a very uh, frequent sophisticated users of Twitter much of this will be very familiar um, so what is econ Twitter so so it's, it's just a word for essentially all activities by economists that happen on Twitter uh, in fact, it's kind of a community. Uh, there's some people from Econ Twitter that I feel are almost friends now, and I've never met them in person. Um, and there's sort of a, 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 yeah, it's like a coffee room where you can meet people and share perspectives. Uh, a way to share research and economics debates with a broader audience. Um, all the points that Dan mentioned about the traditional media would apply here as well. And uh, this is your chance to share with a broader audience uh, things you work on, things you have seen other people work on, um, to broaden a bit the perspective people might have about what economists do. Um, as Dan pointed out, many academic economists shy away from media. So what happens is that a broad part of the public has this impression that who economists are, are these people who call themselves economists and show up uh, as pundits on TV shows and who are actually often representatives of major banks or the private sector or not really actually academic economists and so a lot of people are often surprised uh, when they see what economists share on twitter about what we actually do uh, it's also a place to share information and learn from other economists what's happening in the profession in terms of research in terms of discussion um, so for me it's kind of like happy hour that's always on and you can drop by whenever you feel like uh, what are some of the benefits so you can be connected with a wide range of other economists. For me, that was particularly helpful. I left the United States. I left you know, Cambridge, Massachusetts, where supposedly all the information flows. And I was told to be careful not to get disconnected. And being on Twitter was, for me, a very easy way that I feel like I'm totally in the loop with the conversations that are going on. And I don't feel like isolated uh, being on a different continent. Uh, I learned a lot about new papers and research projects that are going on. It's also cool to get to know other economists from a more personal side without even meeting them in person. People will talk about their pregnancy or their uh, challenges in life that's going on or sharing humor or other things in addition to serious stuff. And so it makes people who otherwise might seem intimidating and scary uh, much more human. So that's also really fun. And then there's some practical things. So there will be sometimes at conferences and events, people live tweeting what's happening in a conference. Um, and now everything's on Zoom, a lot of things are uh, on video, so that has a similar function that economists from around the world can actually follow along what's happening in these conferences. Um, but if it's not online, otherwise it tends to be this very selective elitist event where a lot of people are excluded from. And these live tweets um, provide a, a, an opportunity for many people to follow along the academic discussions and papers being presented. Uh, rather than, as Dan said, having to wait three or four years until things are actually published. Um, as I said, it's diversifying the type of economies that's seen by a larger public. Um, to put the numbers in perspective, obviously it's not television, uh, but you can get pretty uh, big reach. It depends. Uh, some of the tweets that um, you know are met with a lot of interest get shared a lot. So I think my, on average, I would have about four million impressions a month. Uh, of, of tweets that I share and so I, I don't look like the typical economist <laughs> and maybe that helps to diversify a bit the image that people have of our profession and you get to participate in discussions about current issues in the profession those are the kind of discussions that maybe happen at seminar dinners you know among very small groups usually uh, and, and this stuff gets sort of dragged in the open and we're having discussions where students are involved and professors and seniors and juniors to talk about you know what's happening with the culture in our profession there's been a lot of talk about aggressive seminal culture and how can we change it or race and economics and the extreme underrepresentation of black and latino scholars in the us and uh, other ethnic groups in in in, in europe the uh, underrepresented groups um that has become a big topic of discussion in the recent couple of years on econ twitter uh, just last week there were a lot of discussions about ethics in randomized trials and which concerns are valid and which are not and how should we deal with it uh but there's also you know personal stuff like teaching and how do you challenge manage work-life work balance in the COVID time uh, and also a lot of this insider baseball stuff like how do you even become a member of the NBR what are these you know secret things <laughs> that I always wondered about 
and people ask the question and other people will answer and that stuff gets sort of shared more out in the open. I, my sense is, and other people might disagree, but my sense is that Twitter has really contributed to democratizing more the discourse in the economics profession. And, and I really appreciate that. So to this point, uh, there are several sort of inclusive characteristics. Uh, there's exchange of perspective between economists who might otherwise not directly talk, like seniors with juniors, like people from very differently ranked schools, people from academia and policy. Uh, as opposed to conferences or these clubs like NBR and Poverty Action Lab, there's no gatekeeping. So anyone with an internet connection can log on and participate. So that leads to more voice for underrepresented minorities more junior economists, more voice for researchers outside the US and outside these top ranked departments. And also that's kind of nice for people who are in minority groups that even if it may be in your department that there are not that many people of your identity, you get to see a lot of people who look like you on Twitter and you feel less isolated. There's also space for non-research topics such as dealing with stress in the profession. Uh, people are sharing a surprising amount of vulnerability. There have been talks about how do you deal with depression, um, and, and personal challenges and, and really nice mutual support uh, makes people who are struggling with different uh, issues feel less isolated because with all of these things, obviously, we always think we're the only one and then there's many other people who are also struggling. And there's been a lot of discussion about how to deal with racism, sexism and bullying in the profession, which again, I think just even making it an uh, on top of the table discussion instead of something that people whisper about um, has made it much easier for people to to raise the issue. Um, obviously, the profession still has a lot of ways to go with these things, but it's one of the venues where this discourse is being sort of forwarded. Good. So, if this sounds somehow enticing to you, and you have not even ha started having an account, I'm going to start with how do I get started from the very basics. So, you want to create a profile where you actually have a short bio, bio of who you are, so people actually know who this is when they decide whether to read or follow you. So you should actually say, what is your role, what's your affiliation, maybe put a link to your website that is not bragging, it's just helpful for people to know who you are. So that's uh, the easy part, then you can just put that and start reading other people's tweets, and if that's all you want to do, there's lots of people, they call themselves lurkers, who mostly read and never write, and that's completely fine. Uh, to start reading though, you want to start curating your timeline. That means you want to choose who you want to follow because Twitter can be a very different experience depending on who you choose to follow. You know, you, you, for example, you might not want to follow Tom, Donald Trump uh, if you have dance inclinations. In fact, you can even mute the word Trump and you will not see anything about that topic. You want to choose people who, um, you know, make this a valuable experience. And so to start, one of the ways to start is if you feel comfortable, you can share with Twitter the con context of your email. It will tell you who of the people that you know actually are on Twitter. You can start by following those. Or if you're not comfortable with that, pick a few by hand that you know, and then see who they follow that looks interesting in their follow list. And then you read what people write and you'll see, okay, that person, but that person always tweets about Donald Trump's policy. So actually th that's not that interesting to me if I'm then. So let me unfollow that person. But this other person whom I don't know though, that really always says really interesting things about research that I'm interested in. So I'm gonna start following that person. And your network of people you follow will sort of be, it's like a newspaper, but for your own personal taste, because you're gonna to subscribe to the columns uh, of the writers that you are interested in. So um, I think, I, wait, actually I'm gonna jump because here, I actually had a, have one slide that is um, about what, how I choose to, to, to follow people. So I uh, tend to follow almost anyone who's an interesting uh, fellow economics researcher. Um, uh, beyond that, people who open new worlds to me um, from other cultures, other countries, uh, people I observe online being kind and constructive, and Twitter feeds that make me smile or think. For example, I really like the, I really like the Innovation for Poverty Action Lab because it has a lot of good humor. So, so there's the greedy taste. Then who I tend to unfollow is people who make me upset, people who seem just out there to provoke, people who advocate extreme viewpoints in an unnuanced way, uh, and people, I have a similar taste to Dan, who mostly focus on daily news. That's not my purpose for being on Twitter. Some people do, 
want to follow daily news on Twitter, and that's just a different taste, right? So you can curate your own thing. So now I'm going to jump back to how do I get started. So now you have started with a group of people you follow. Now you might be shy what to do first. So the easiest thing to do is you just retweet something interesting somebody else wrote. So you don't actually have to type something. You just retweet and the people who follow you can read what you what somebody else wrote that you liked. And then the first easiest thing is just to say very cool or nice or check it out <laughs> when you retweet it. So you're already you're writing something or comment below somebody else's tweet. And then if you want to start sharing stuff like constructive things are always share something interesting you read, something you saw presented, an interesting statistic, something that people might be interested in. And over time, it will organically start to feel comfortable and you get the vibe of this online sort of discourse. Okay, there's a, part, a few particular things of econ Twitter specifically that are not generally Twitter. Uh, that might be helpful to know. Um, let me just, I'm sorry, let me mute myself because I have to blow my nose. I was sick last week, so I'm still recovering a bit. Okay, so one of the cool things that you can use is this hashtag econ advice, because it allows you to both ask questions and answer questions and really builds to that community. So, you know, a lot of talk about this hidden curriculum that a lot of stuff some economists think is obvious and other people who are not so much maybe in the center of power don't really know or don't dare to ask or don't know who to ask. So the goal is to make this hidden curriculum less hidden. You can ask any question by adding that hashtag econ advice to the tweet and then I will retweet it, others will retweet it and people can answer or, and which happens a lot, people don't want to publicly ask a question like that. So you can email me or Paul um, and we will tweet it out anonymously. Like, you know, here is a second year master's student who has the following question or here's an assistant professor who's wondering about this or that. So if you are using econ Twitter, please search for econ advice occasionally so that you can see the questions that are being asked and help answer. Uh, you might be sometimes answering and sometimes asking a question. So here's some examples. Here, Pietro is asking how many universities are giving tenure clock extensions because of Corona, uh, because it's something that he wanted to negotiate also with his um, promotion committee. Um, here's an email I retweeted from, from somebody who sent me a, an email personally uh, from India and was asking about PhD applications. Um, and here Nathaniel is tweeting about, he's starting a brown bag launch and wants to get advice from other people who do the similar thing. Then you see, for example, you know, 22 people responded, uh, 61 people responded on the COVID, so it's quite active. The last one is called EconRA. This is not a hashtag, it's actually an account. But if you include the name of that account in your advertising for a position when you're hiring a research assistant or a pre-doc, uh, this will then be shared by that account and job applicants, students who are looking to apply can go to that account and find these positions. And one of the goals of that is to be, get a bit of a broader network so that the students who get into these RA positions aren't always the ones from the same narrow set of schools. How am I doing with time? You still have um, six minutes. Perfect. Perfect. Great. So now other things you can do, share new interesting papers you saw or wrote. So for example, make a picture of the abstract. It's always nice to include a picture in the tweet. It will be much more seen. A brief summary of the results or why you liked it. And if you know that the authors are on Twitter, you can include the, uh, the handles of the authors. So if there's a discussion about the paper afterwards, the authors are already included. I already mentioned live tweeting conferences and seminars. It's a huge public service. People from around the world who can't be there really appreciate it. Uh, however, always ask the presenter first if they are okay with it, of course, because sometimes people are presenting early work. They won't, don't want to circulate it around the planet. You can uh, make a Twitter summary of a paper across multiple tweets. That's called a thread. A thread is simply you write a tweet and you respond to your own tweet and they come one after you, the other. And you can mark them first of N, second of N, so people know that this is a series of tweets. So here is an example, for example, um, by Alexander, who, who wrote a tweet about a new paper of his about whether individuals commit, to what extent individuals commit to their partner for life. And then in the top, he has his, you know, the abstract and the title, and then he has 14 tweets summarizing the key takeaways um, of the paper. So people don't have to go read the entire thing, or they can read the entire thing if, if that tweet summary seems interesting to them. 
Then there's this hashtag, what economists really do, which I just think is really fun. I think Oriana Bandiera started it. Um, and it's just exactly with this intention to show the uh, broader audience that the breadth of what economics research really is about. Um, as you know, many people believe that economics research is just sort of uh, financial, monetary economics and, and finance. Um, and they're often surprised uh, to learn about research like Amy Finkelstein's work on health economics um, or, or, or the perspective of um, Lisa Cook, uh, who's talking about the culture and economics and race and economics in this interview here. Um, but so, so this is a hashtag if you want to sort of highlight to a broader audience that we are a less narrow profession. Or if you want to get excited again, when you forget how excited you were when you started studying economics, go to the hashtag and find some fun stuff. Okay, the last part I wanted to talk a bit, you might have heard horror stories about the unpleasant sides of Twitter. So how do you make this a pleasant experience? So the first thing I already said, choose your crowd. Twitter is a very different experience depending who you follow. Politics Twitter is very different from sports Twitter, is very different from econ Twitter and you can choose. Always remember that Twitter is voluntary and optional. If it ever gets on your nerves, get out, right? Like I do that often, sometimes for two minutes, sometimes for two weeks, like I take a break, it's totally fine. This is not your job description. It's supposed to be fun and nice. And if not, you know, it's, it's, it's no problem. There's also no obligation to respond. This is not like email. When I'm not in the mood, I don't engage. When I'm in the mood, for me, it's like coffee break. You know, I think some people have cigarette breaks. I have Twitter breaks. So, um, but sometimes I don't need a Twitter break and then I won't respond and it's fine. You can also mute keywords and you can mute people. So I have muted the word Trump, so it will not show up, it's actually true. Um, I have muted a few other words um, and, and you can mute people as well. I, um, I'll show, uh, I think next or the slide after. So to not what is not helpful here. You can mute and block people. So one potential approach is you mute accounts to protect your own peace of mind and you block accounts when you want to protect your followers. So if somebody aggravates me, I will mute them. If somebody starts to insult me or insult somebody in my timeline, especially if they're anonymous accounts that sound like trolls, I will block them because they're actually a negative force for other people also. They will no longer be able to see my tweets or interact in my timeline. Another thing that's cool that many people don't know, you can set your settings such that the notifications you get of somebody responding to your tweets and things are only from people who either follow you or you follow them. So somebody who does not follow me and I don't follow them, they don't know me, it's much more likely that they have the unconstructive type of response. So yeah, of course, economists don't understand that, that kind of thing, right? So that is not, so, um, you, when you set the settings like that, you will remove a lot of these less constructive comments just from your notifications, you won't even see them. So that's a easy thing for peace of mind. I think to get cool stuff on top is you can make Twitter lists of people, for example, by topics, so for example, I have an, a Twitter list called Swiss. And so if there's a Swiss news event, I'm gonna go on that list. Or you can have short favorite lists. I have like favorite lists where when I don't have a lot of time, I just read my favorite lists first. And they tend to be the kind of tweeters that, whose tweets I enjoy particularly, and it's sort of a curated list. And you can keep it private so people are not offended if they're not on it. You can make public ones, and particularly you can say, here's a climate change list, and people can follow that topic. Um, that also really helps to have it to be, you know, that you find what you're interested in uh, in your timeline. Last part is if you want to engage in Twitter debates, right? So that's the part where, as Dan said, sometimes it gets controversial, sometimes you get nasty comments. So it's absolutely optional. Again, everything on Twitter. If you don't enjoy debates, no problem. I am a person who loves debates, so this is great for me. So, so I found the following approaches helpful. So I try to assume that people are interested in dialogue and have good intentions until I learn otherwise, because short messages in writing are very easy for misunderstandings across people who don't know each other. It's very easy to assume they don't mean well, when in fact they often do. So I often ask questions, how do you mean this? What brings you to this conclusion? And many times when I was convinced that somebody was just an aggressive troll, it turned out that this type of an open-ended question reveals that I had misunderstood and they really didn't get it or they really had a different perspective. If not, then you learn at that point if they keep, still keep saying, uh, of course, blah, 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 vomit. <laughs> At that point, you can mute them. 
or if they say uh, insults at that code, you can you can uh, block them, but don't assume too quickly that they don't don't want to. There are some real asshole accounts, and it's very important to remember that those don't represent the world. The most extreme ones are likely actually even paid trolls that are paid from Russia or somewhere to make people you know fight with each other. So don't confuse that with reality because otherwise we can get very depressed. But it's a very small number of accounts that tweet a lot, so make sure to just block them or mute them. And also if you're in a constructive conversation but it's getting time consuming or exhausting, you can leave at any time. Again, it's all volunteer and just politely say goodbye, I have to go back to work, have a good evening. I do that very often, it's no problem, don't feel obligated. Don't forget the possibility of talking directly. So when com conversations get complicated and personal, I always switch to the direct message option if the other person's direct message are allowed, because if it gets too personal in public, it's not good. And they often sort out things in, in bilateral. And in some cases, actually several times has happened when a conversation is intense, but important and interesting to me, I've met people in person afterwards and, and very constructive debates have ensued. So to conclude, Twitter can be a great way to keep motivated about research for me. It gives me, in those types of conversations, it actually brought me to economics in the first place. Discussions about the state of the world and ways to improve it, rather than, you know, referee two's comment number 16, or here's like a, a fourth way to cluster the standard errors differently. That's important, but it's not always that exciting. And so this keeps me focused on, on why, why am I doing this. One perspective how Twitter can occur for me is like a great kitchen table in college where you know you, you used to come home late at night and some people in the kitchen are talking and you sit down for a few minutes and you can engage with them and you can leave at any time. And it, it's just the difference is it's going on all the time and it expands the whole world and you can tune in anytime. It can be stimulating and fun. And when it's not, just step away. So that's it. Somebody made a word cloud of Econ Twitter 2019. That's what showed up as the most frequent words. Gives you a bit of an impression of, uh, I don't know, the type of topics. Um, but yeah, if you haven't shown yet Twitter, hopefully I'll see you online soon. Uh, if you are on it and you hate it, never hesitate to, 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 to take a break. Uh, Wonderful. Thank, thank you very much. Questions. Thank you very much. Uh, so this was a very exciting talk and very useful as well. I saw that, uh, could you please stop sharing your screen, uh, Dina? So I saw that uh, Dan at several points was uh, responding very enthusiastically to your talk. So I don't rule out that today we can welcome another member to the Twitter, Econ Twitter community. Is that correct, Dan? Or no, because it takes an investment and my horizon is too short to spend my time on this. But I encourage younger people to spend their time doing it. I had a question if I might ask Dina, if we're allowed to interact like this. Um, I have twice in the last 10 years looked at econ job rumors, which I'm sure you're familiar with. Okay, you've already answered my question, I think, but maybe a few words about that that you might say for those who are listening. Well, it's a completely separate thing. It's a very toxic place. Okay. It's full of very misinformed people who are trying to spew hate. It's a mixture of trolls and some actual economists who are somehow enjoying making feel, other people feel bad. Um, the information there is notoriously unreliable. Once in a while, something might be correct, once in a while not. So if you actually have a question you really would like to have an answer to, use econ advice because we have this Twitter thing and people will correct each other and it is a much more high quality place. Mm -hmm. Good, thank you. And, and econ advice is open in particular to young scholars, is that correct? Anyone. Anyone, right. Uh, any questions you have about the profession? I mean, we've had people say, uh, you know, I have had waited four months for a first response. It seems like the editor hasn't sent out the paper yet. Should I email them? Mm -hmm. You know, so it, anything. Right. So here I have one question for you, Dina, on the, on the chat. Uh, so the question is, uh, how do you use actually the hashtag econ Twitter? Should it be at the end of every tweet directed to other economists or only sometimes? I don't know, actually, yeah, I think I only use it when I talk about Econ Twitter. When I say Econ Twitter is fun and I would use it, I don't tag all the messages, but I don't know, it's, I, I don't think it has a very clear function as opposed to Econ RA and Econ Advice that have a clear function. Econ Twitter is more of a descriptor. I see, okay, so it's just an option, I see. Yes. Mm -hmm. 
Um, so earlier on, there was a question for, uh, for Dan. Uh, so Dan, you mentioned that it's important that the best available economist addresses a particular issue in the media. Now, um, how about availability? So how do we do as a profession? Are people sufficiently available or uh, should something change to make, well, the best people more available? Well, remember, there are two aspects of best on this. One, the person who substantively knows the most. The other is, is the person capable of getting out two coherent sentences in a row? And as you well know, a lot of us are simply not capable of doing that. So again, it's a trade-off like everything else in life. If you're pretty much expert on something, but not the very best, but other people don't want to do it, then you got to step up to the plate and swing the bat, to use my baseball examples. But uh, I know so many times in Texas, in the department when I taught there, I know there'd be macro people who are better than I at answering a question, but they refuse to get on the television. They think their time is too important in a lot of cases. Believe me, it's not. And so again, a trade-off, it's up to you to decide if you know enough to give a decent answer and can get the idea across. Mm -hmm. So you're saying that not always, you know, people from particular fields are really available. So should universities be more active in this? You maybe even provide incentives to, uh, induce people to, you know, participate or? I've been told that a lot of business schools actually base your salary increases and your pay in general on the amount of media attention you get. I believe Chicago does that, I'm not sure. But I think it's more lip service. In the end, you're doing this to benefit the public and maybe make yourself happy. It's not gonna get universities anything other than the visibility and maybe a few more donations from alumni. Mm -hmm. Um, so, uh, Dina, so, so what, what is your experience on this on, on Twitter? So, uh, issues are discussed there, also issues about economic policy. Do you have the impression that um, the uh, Twitter works in that way that eventually sort of, you know, the best available, most reliable sort of uh, economic insights uh, uh, sort of prevail and, and, and are communicated to a broad audience? Well, I think I would, with economic policy, I would really distinguish between the politics surrounding economics. If you Google like the economic impacts of COVID, you'll obviously get tons of noise, right? Because it's just Mr. Mm -hmm. Anyone and, and their politically motivated neighbor. Um, so that's, you know, I don't think econ Twitter can, has that much of an influence that it will tune all that out. But I do think that in the conversations that we have, uh, where a substantial number of actual economists are discussing an actual issue, uh, even an economic policy issue, um, it usually, I find I usually learn something from the discussion. Mm -hmm. uh, there's not necessarily a conclusion, right? Now we agree on something. It's more like if you have a panel discussion, people will, will still agree at the, at the end. And it has also happened in some cases when there were very heated discussions that people ended up writing sort of blog posts or little papers summarizing their, and it turns out actually this is a more substantive point. I mean, there was a lot of discussion, for example, about the wealth tax where people ended up writing entire papers, at, well, not actually publications, you know, but like summarizing what they were trying to convey on Twitter and it sparked something uh, more serious that way. Um, but uh, yeah, I do think that oftentimes very constructive voices get a lot of say. I see, yeah. And, and does Twitter also work in, in a way that you can also with like retweeting sort of, uh, yeah, that, it, that sort of sounds like a, like a, like a vote. So that, so that is, is that also how you use it? Like that you sort of no, try- I, I think retweeting is very important to amplify other people's perspectives in research, particularly I try to amplify research perspectives that are underrepresented. You know, I mean, Raj Chetty may not need all of retweets. He's already everywhere. And I might still retweet it because I find it very interesting. I might still retweet that also exactly for this, what economists really do thing where non-economists may have never heard of Raj Chetty, but also you know, young economists or economists of, of color or people who are not from the US um, to retweet, to amplify more things that are not showing up at the NBR working paper list uh, and things like that. Uh, but I don't think there's a voting or now we agree or now there's a consensus. It's more of a town hall type of thing. Yeah. 
So talking about young economists, I noticed we have many young economists in the audience. Uh, Dan, uh, what is the uh, best stage in a career to be active in the, in the media? And is there also a stage perhaps early on where you should try and avoid it or? No, well, given that it doesn't take much time, I would say there's no point where you should try to avoid this. And moreover, the earlier, like anything else in our lives, the earlier you invest in it, the longer and better returns you have on the investment. Uh, I sort of envy the younger people because when I was starting out as assistant professor in 1969, the media were nowhere nearly so developed as they are now. So all the more reason, not just early, but now both your age and your cohort suggest the sooner the better. And, and Dina, does that also hold for social media? Is it a good idea to be active? I think also even, even more for social media because it's even lower barrier and, and, and you have maybe even more things you want to ask or you don't want to feel included in. Um, I think it's, it's also for younger people, it tends to be easier. They grow up with that stuff. And so I think it's also a lower barrier. I have to say, I disagree a bit with it. it takes zero time with the interviews. I have done a bit of media in Switzerland and when you're new and I'm new with the traditional media. I do, I mean, I need to prepare what I'm going to say and when it's TV, I need to go to the hairdresser. I, you know, if it's not TV, <laughs> they send it. If it's in writing, they send it to you afterwards. It has mistakes. You have to, it takes a day or so. Mm -hmm. If it's like a I big... Guess, I guess I have an advantage. I don't need to go to the hairdresser. To the hairdresser, exactly. <laughs> So, so I give myself a little bit like a quota. I can do so, so many for a year and then it's full because I, I, I enjoy it, obviously, as you can tell, I, I love talking to people. I need to make sure I don't do uh, too much of these types of things so I have time for research. Yeah, yeah talking about uh, spending time on social media. So there's a question from the audience about um, how, how can one best organize the enormous amount of information on Twitter and keeping up with the speed of the discussion uh, is it mostly a question of being online almost all of the time? No, don't think you have to catch it all, I think is the thing. There's, I don't read nearly every tweet that goes through my timeline, right? So uh, that's why you maybe you make a curated list of special people that you're very interested in that maybe you have the time to read those every day. But you shouldn't start feeling like email where you see yet another chore. It's more like a newspaper for me where like, you know, you skip some parts or there's days where you don't open the newspaper at all and it's also fine. So you log in and then you ignore a lot of tweets that are there. You I don't log in all the time and then I just see what's on top or I see what's in my short list and I don't read everything that happened. It's impossible. It's impossible. It's impossible. Yeah. 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 So um, we have two minutes left and there's, there's one um, more sort of a general question that holds both for the older media and the social media. So let, let's first go to Dan. Uh, so it is about, um, yeah, so in how far should academic economists uh, share their uh, opinions rather than their insights only? Because this could easily, you know, people could be confused, no, when you make statements that are, that are basically an opinion, no? Look, if one's making an opinion, one be, must be absolutely clear that your opinion is really no better on this than that of any other economist or indeed that of any other person. Give you an example. I was on TV many times talking about the possible need for legislation to prevent discrimination against ugly people. Okay. And I said, look, we know there's discrimination. That's what some of my work's about, but the need for it, that's my own personal opinion. You may disagree for a whole variety of reasons. So make it absolutely clear, separate economic fact, economic research from opinion that's different. Does that also hold for Twitter, Dina? Is there a button where you could then indicate this is my opinion and not uh... Yeah, so I, I just was thinking about when you were talking then, for me, I make a bit of a distinction between Twitter and the traditional media. In the traditional media, I don't talk that often in the traditional media, but I try to very much stay with, here's what the research can contribute, because they ask me a lot about political things and they always want to ask my opinion and it's not that important. And I feel like the credibility that I bring is really to summarize the research when I go on the on the on the television. But in, in Twitter, it's a bit more mixed. I think it's often clear what which is which. I very much agree with Dan. It's very important to separate those. I think not all like, academics do that always in their research or in their media work. And I think it's very important to clearly say, here's my personal opinion. 
and here is what we know uh, from research. Wonderful. Well, uh, yeah, in the interest of time, I'm afraid it's not time to finish the session. So thanks again to our Thank two much. speakers, Dan and Dina. It was really great to have you here, and thanks for all your useful advice. So we will go now to the virtual Rotterdam Coffee Corner. So you can find that uh, on the homepage of the virtual EEA Congress. Uh, somewhere in the middle, if you click, then you can stroll around and, well, um, maybe you can find us there and then we can continue the discussion a bit. I also invite you to take a look at the Q&A. Uh, so there have been a couple of interesting suggestions for further advice also in the, in the, in the Q&A in this particular session. So you may also want to have a look at that. So let me end then the session by thanking you all for your interest and uh, wishing you a great virtual congress. Thank you so Bye. much. Thank you. Thank you. See you in the coffee room. <laughs>